and it really painting becomes almost a dance and and i am using my whole body i see that people with easels will sometimes find themselves sitting i am never sitting i am never sitting and i, I use my whole body i use my whole arm I move forward, I move backwards. And, and one of the wonderful things about the space is that I can move back. And if I am painting large, let's say six feet wide, I can move back, move back far enough that the entire painting falls inside my cone of vision. So I don't have to be moving my head to see the painting. And I, am, I can see more than one painting at a time, as a matter of fact. I'm originally from Panama. I moved to San Antonio, Texas in 1988. In 2006, I started working full-time at Austin Community College. The wonderful thing about being a professor in an art department, as well as being a practicing artist, is that no matter where I am, I get to talk about art. I get to live and breathe it. I consider La Avenida Central to be my Sistine ceiling, where you find the Michelangelo. This is, these are my Michelangelos, because on La Avenida Central, you can see, you know, one after another, lots of little painted images. And one of the things that I love about the cell phones, by the way, is that the screen, you're, you, we were talking about being alive and being animated. Yes, I, I'm very animated when I paint but the paintings themselves are very animated. They'll be, they'll be sweating if it's a cold beer, dripping if it's a paleta, you know, they will be booming or vibrating if they're a radio, if it's an electric iron, a steam iron, it'll be blowing off steam. A car will be kicking up dirt. The cell phone, the images, you know, they're an image that's, that's changeable. And the fonts, they're all mixed and, you, and, and they're alive. Look at the swagger underneath that M for mania. Surviving a dictatorship, the first 10 years at, when I got to the United States in 1988, I painted black and white. And I did make references to disembodied heads, to chopped up body parts. I mean, People didn't know that's what was in there, but I, but they all looked like charts. And I was literally organizing the world, trying to make order out of chaos. A little bit of that continues to insert itself in these works because I also continue to make order. I classify and I categorize and they, they're like charts sometimes. So there's a little bit of that still, but I feel that I became free from the dictatorship, I am no longer a victim. When I was able to come back to color, when I, when, and, and these were the images that I started working with. So I could also say they've rescued me. I've never said that before, but in, that's in a way what they did. And, and they're me, I love them. They're in me. I, I love talking about them with you, with, I love talking about them. I, I learn something every single time. And, and I much prefer to think about human beings and our humanity than about the horrors that we're also capable of engendering. We just put them up salon style. And I, and I love the idea of salon style because one of the places that I find a lot of my paintings, images are in beauty parlors, which are salones de belleza. In beauty parlors is where I learned the meaning of the word aesthetics. 
And the definition for aesthetic is the study of beauty. And when I came to graduate school in the United States, I had teachers in English talking about aesthetics. And because I always wanted to sound like intelligent, I didn't let them know that I had no idea what they meant. And I would look up the definition and I still didn't really understand it. And then I, I went back home and I saw Salon de Belleza y Estetica. And I went, oh, that's what they're talking about. Because I understood estetica because like you have to have your hair done a certain way and your fingernails a certain way and your skin a certain way and your eyebrows a certain way. So I had been, my goodness, culturally overwhelmed by the aesthetics that I was supposed to be buying into. I knew exactly the cage and the freedom that aesthetics can be. In Panama, when we have a store that has everything in it, it's going to be a casa, casa del tornillo, la casa del colchón, la casa del médico, la casa de whatever. And then here, I just love it, um, mini super. It's just like a contradiction. It's like wet dry, like the wet dry vac. <laughs> and, um, and it turns out that um, the mini super, this photograph, I've been dreaming about it for about 20 years. It no longer exists in the real world. And... It has items that I am attached to emotionally. So growing up, I mean, I know the jingle for seis, super espumoso, jabón rosado y verde. And everybody has sopa de pollo con fideo magi. You need the, to have a gallon of cooking oil pavo to fix your patacones and chicharrones and yuca frita and empanadas. And another thing that you see a lot in these paintings on the shops is that they're being made for people who maybe don't have a lot of money because who buys one roll of toilet paper? I don't think you can buy that in the United States. This, this is just culturally so fascinating. I mean, the quantity, you buy the oil by the gallon, you buy the soup by the envelope, and you buy the toilet paper by the roll. I did create this work during COVID. And it's interesting how it turns out that during COVID, these are the things that ran out, toilet paper, paper products. And of course, everybody was buying detergents and soaps and stocking up on food that doesn't go bad. I took different pieces, of, enormous rolls of paper, but just chopped it up and, 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 and assembled them almost like a jigsaw puzzle. And then I, I have to fit my images into that shape just the way the artists have to fit their paintings onto a wall and i actually when one thing that's important to know is that i do not copy these paintings faithfully so there was never a wall that had the all these objects and the sopa de pollo i wanted to put the sopa de pollo in there and i i will later forget what i made up and what i didn't make up and so i invented the sparkle around the toilet paper because it needed something there but of course, I've seen the sparkle in other places. So my images are recombinations of the objects. So growing up in the 70s in Panama, there were no fine art museums. And I didn't have, I didn't see anybody making a painting. I, I realized actually 10 years after graduating from college, Let's see, I graduated in 1983 and it was about 1995 that I realized, oh, I don't have to worry about catching up with Western art history because I have my own visual history and this is it. This is what I grew up surrounded by. This is the imagery that percolated through my eyes, into my mind, into the fiber of my being. And I don't need to go to college. I don't need an education to comprehend it. And I realize now that for Renoir, for Monet, that was their world. They didn't have to go to school to learn about La Grenouillère, which is that wonderful little lake where they all went on Sundays to go boating and drink beer. They, they were living it. And so I, this is, these tienditas, these little shops, mom and pop shops that advertise their wares outside with hand-painted signage, 
these are my Grenouillère. These are my Caves of Lascaux. It is my understanding a lot of people grow up in worlds like that. I mean, it isn't most of us that have access to museums and art educations. I'm very, very lucky to have received an art education, both undergraduate and graduate. And one of the dilemmas is how do I, with an academic background, paint works that are made by people who are not academically trained. And the answer I've discovered is that I will study, I will pay homage, I will honor, and I will celebrate work by these people who are not academically trained. I will study their work with the same rigor that I was taught to study the quote-unquote great masters of Western art.